All right, well, we'll give you a kick off. I know it's uh, some people have found it a bit tricky to find the room. I wasn't sure where it was either, so thank you all for persevering. Um, so, yeah, look, my name's Katrina Fox. Um, I'm from London originally, and I moved to Sydney, Australia 14 years ago. Um, always loved coming back, and it's absolutely fantastic coming back for an amazing event like this. I went vegan uh, nearly 20 years ago, 1996, and um, I remember going to the vegan expos at Red Lion Square at um, Conway Hall, which was like a little town hall with maybe a few hundred people. And it's really amazing to see an event of this size, you know, over 10,000 people, I think, are through. Um, people were turned away yesterday. I mean, I know it's kind of, I felt bad for anyone that was turned away, but on the other hand, how cool was it that people are desperate to get into and queuing up to get into um, a vegan living event, so it's really great. So I'm going to be talking about vegan world domination, uh, one business at a time. Um, because I really want to give props to the organisers of VegFest because they've put this talk, which is about vegan businesses, as part of the Activists' Summit. And I think that's a really important point because running a vegan business, it is a form of activism. Often we don't think of it that way. We think of activism as, you know, being uh, chased by riot police, which I've been in the, the 90s on animal rights demos, or, you know, chaining yourself to fa in factory farms, or, 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 you know, even signing an online petition. There's all these different forms of activism, but people don't often think of running a business um, as a form of activism. So I'm really pleased to be um, talking to you about this today. Um, so my background, as I mentioned, I'm a journalist. Um, I've been a journalist for 17 years. I started out here in the UK and then moved to Sydney, Australia. So I've worked on a whole range of publications, some niche media, and I've also freelanced for mainstream media, such as the Sydney Morning Herald, which is a state newspaper in Sydney, and the ABC, which is the sister organisation to the BBC here in the UK. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to write about um, animal rights issues um, and to help get the message out there. So that was my form of of activism for, for quite some time. Um, and then I put together a book. I wrote a book which is launching this weekend on how to start and grow a successful vegan business. And I, wa I wrote it because I wanted to know how to do that. Even though I've been running my own uh, freelance journalism uh, business for a while, I didn't really, I guess, think of it as running a vegan-run business, and I wanted to, to learn these skills. There's a lot of general business books out in the marketplace, but I couldn't find anything that was specifically on how to start and grow a vegan business, you know, what the specific challenges are for vegan business owners and how they overcome them. Um, so I put together uh, the book. I spent a year. I interviewed 65 owners of vegan-run businesses in America, Canada, the UK, and Australia. I did a really deep dive into their businesses, uh, did extensive interviews with them, and then pulled out um, their successes, their se secrets of success, as, it, as I mentioned before, what their challenges are and how to overcome them, and then added in some, obviously some information um, that are linked with my skills, which is media, PR, how to get into the media, how to raise your profile, along with social media marketing, etc. So that was um, the Sydney launch, and um, yeah, the launch is here today. So that's a bit about um, my background. So as I mentioned, running a, um, a vegan business, it is a form of activism. The more you can make it easier for people to embrace vegan living, the more you're helping animals, the more you're helping people, and the more you're helping the planet. Um, you know, I, I know as activists, we would love to be able to, as soon as we tell people, right, this is what happens on a factory farm, this is what happens in the dairy industry, we'd love it if people just went, oh, I didn't know that, right, okay, great, I'm going vegan, and they go vegan overnight. Who's had that experience? Anyone? No. It's hard. One, Charlotte, you've had one experience. Oh, good. You must be very good at converting people. But majority of the time, it doesn't happen. But I really believe that at heart, people are good-natured. It's just that we've been indoctrinated, you know, by our culture to eat meat, to use animals, to commodify them. But if all things being equal, if they could choose between a product that's cruelty-free, that's good for people, animals, and planet, and one that isn't, they would choose the one that is ethical. Like I say, with, with all things being equal, so in terms of affordability, durability, etc., they would choose the, the ethical one. Um, so I, I love the fact that, you know, here at VegFest, you've got all these stalls of, of new businesses are starting up. Veganism's trendy at the moment. As a journalist, I've, I've never seen such positive media coverage. Um, you know, even places like the Daily Mail, um, you know, are, are running uh, positive articles around veganism. So we are at the crest of a wave. 
At no time in history, I think, has veganism been more popular. So it's a perfect time to start and run a business if that's what you feel you'd like to do. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the... Uh, the, the key ingredients, some of the secrets of success in order to run um, a vegan business. Before I do that, I just want to mention this is really quite exciting because not only are people starting and running vegan businesses from scratch or some of the vegan business owners here have been in business for a long time, what's also happening is that regular mainstream businesses are going vegan. This is Gigi's Pizzeria in Newtown in Sydney where I'm from, where I'm living now. And they were a very successful pizza business, you know, with meat and dairy, etc. They had queues around the door, they were really popular. But the owner, Marco, he had a shift in conscience and he became personally vegan and he realised he couldn't continue to run his regular business um, with serving meat and dairy. Now because his um, organisation, his company is certified by a particular association in Naples, they have to jump through a lot of hoops to keep their certification. One of which is they can only use high grade mozzarella cheese. They're not allowed to have any substitutes. So that meant no vegan cheese. Now, they got a lot of mainstream media coverage, and of course there was the usual typical outcry you know, of customers going, oh, I'm not going back there. How can you have pizza with no cheese and, and all of this? And I must admit, when I heard that they were not going to have cheese on their pizza, like not even vegan cheese, I thought, oh my God, you know, what are they doing? Are they going to commit professional suicide? But honestly, I went along. That's just taken with my iPhone, and I'm not a photographer, so I'm not sure my picture does it justice. But those pizzas are the best I've ever tasted. They just did amazing things with cauliflower puree and oil and were just amazing. And they continue to have queues around the door. So I think that's a really, really great thing. Also in Sydney, Sydney's leading the way at the moment, which is kind of exciting. This is a company called Soul Burger. It's run by a medical doctor who's also an entrepreneur. Now, up to date, they've been what's called, uh, they've pitched themselves as a flexitarian. So half their offerings were vegetarian and vegan, and the other half were meat-based burgers. From November, they're going all plant-based. They've just announced it, all vegan. And this is run by a medical doctor. So we're expecting to get a lot of media, a lot of press for that. So this is really exciting times. Um, also in America it's happening. This is an award-winning Mexican vegan restaurant called La Blue Casa in Texas of all places. Texas, very, very heavy, big meat-eating country, uh, state in America. This, um, this business, again, they saw a film called Cowspiracy that some of you might be aware of, which is all about how animal agriculture devastates the environment. The owners saw this and they decided, again, can't run my business along those lines anymore. And they've gone really like full on. They're not even, they're not using plant-based or plant-powered. They are running this very, very full on campaign, which you can see on the left, uh, educating their customers um, and being pretty in your face about it, quite brave of them, about um, how animal agriculture is absolutely devastating the planet. So these are quite risky things that these businesses are taking because they're all very successful, making money, um, but they've decided that they can no longer do this anymore because uh, it, it's no longer in line with their ethics. They've had their eyes open. So it really is, I just want to impress on you, it really is um, an exciting time. And if you are thinking about you know, starting your own business and you want to run it on ethical vegan principles, now really is a good time. And it's not age driven. You, know, you don't have to be of a particular age. There are you know, young people, teenagers making money off YouTube and, and online businesses. So it is really exciting times. Um, so yes, yeah, that's a picture of the book. Um, that, um, as I say, I interviewed 65 owners of vegan-run businesses. Now, any business owner, are there any business owners in the room that are already running? So, you know how your time is incredibly precious. So, the, the business owners I interviewed, I mean, they, they really were generous in sharing their insights. They were very honest in what their challenges are and were and how they overcame them. I initially thought when I started putting this book together, I thought, well, what if no one talks to me? You know, what if all these vegan businesses say, no, we don't want to share our secrets. You know, we don't want the competition. None of them did that. They were all really excited. They were like, yes, we want more vegan businesses because we're all sharing this same goal of a vegan world. And they were only too happy to share their secrets of success. So without tooting my own horn, I've put the book together, but it's very much a collaborative effort. And I want to get their insights out there to inspire and encourage people to start and run their own businesses. 
So I'm going to talk about some of the key ingredients um, that are required to start up a vegan business. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the, the detailed practicalities around tax and business plans and that kind of thing. It's very specific to industries and obviously to the different countries. So what I'm going to be talking about are some of these overarching um, concepts that are really, really important to starting and growing a vegan business. And the first one is know your why. What is your why? What's your mission? What's your purpose? What's your reason for starting your business? If it's only profit, then that's not so great and you, you may not necessarily be that successful. I'm not saying that you shouldn't make a profit. You must make a profit to run a business, otherwise you've got an expensive hobby. Right? But you must be clear on your purpose because your, your purpose and your why is what's going to get you out of bed in the morning. It's what's going to motivate you when things start to get tricky and difficult. Um, it's what's going to influence your branding and your marketing and have people come to you, be attracted to you, want to follow you, become part of your tribe. Some of you might have seen um, a YouTube video by a guy called, uh, a TED talk actually, by a guy called Simon Sinek, who's written a book called Start With Why, and it's one of the most viewed TED talks. And he says the most successful companies in the world are the ones that not only know how they do something or what they do, they know why they're doing it. And one of the companies he cites is Apple. You know, Apple doesn't just sell computers. Apple's why is about challenging the status quo and selling computers and other cool and funky stuff is the vehicle that they do it. But they're successful because of their why. People are, you know, become part of the Apple cult because of the company's why, not because of the computers and the gadgets they make. So it's really important to know what your why is. With the people that I interviewed, um, a large majority of them, it was animal welfare. So they care about animals. That's their why. It's their form of activism. Um, for others, it comes from a health point of view. So they're passionate about uh, people becoming healthy and plant-based is uh, the vehicle to do that. And for some people, it was um, environmental. But for the majority um, that I interviewed, and obviously 65 business owners, is only a tiny microcosm of the vegan businesses out there. Um, but certainly the majority were, were certainly passionate about animal welfare. Now, this is Jessica Bailey. She runs, um, she's a friend of mine, she runs the Cruelty Free Shop in Sydney, Australia. She started her business online to begin with in 2001, um, and then she opened her first shop in, uh, in Sydney in 2012, and then just two years later, she opened another physical shop in Melbourne, in a different state in Australia. And the reason I've got Jess up here is, your why may evolve over time. Um, and that's good. And it's good if you're an established business, like I know some of you here are already running businesses, it's good to check in with yourselves and, and, and ask, has your, is your why still the same as when you started your business and, and, and now? Because sometimes it changes. When Jessica started the Cruelty Free Shop, her aim was to service the vegan market. Okay, she wanted to make sure vegans had easy access to uh, food, to clothing, um, and all those other kinds of things, skincare, etc. As she's now got her physical shop, she's got a shop window. So she uses the window to educate people. So she might, like recently, she ran a ditch dairy campaign. So she had a lot of information in the window about did you know this about milk, etc.? Did you know the cruelty, the baby cows are stolen from their mothers? And then, of course, you know, being a clever businesswoman, she's also got a product display of here are some dairy alternatives if you want to get them. So her why has evolved now to become more of a, a public education service, um, as well as serving non-vegans as well, because a lot of people that come into the cruelty-free shop, you know, they're walking past, they're curious, they're not necessarily already converted vegans, they're like, oh, what is this? And they're going in to buy. So just check in with yourself as you go through with your business to figure out what your why is. The second important thing is mindset. Mindset's really, really important. And I think it's particularly important for people who are running ethical businesses and for people who have come from activist backgrounds. And I very much include myself in that. A lot of people who come from activist backgrounds have major money issues. They think money is bad, money is evil. I don't want money, take money away. Money is what's making me, uh, it'll turn me into a, a horrible person, it will corrupt me. Money does none of that. Money is a tool, it's an energy. It's like a knife. You can take a knife and you can slit someone's throat with it or you can use it to chop vegetables to put in a smoothie. It's a tool. And if you're going to start a business, and business is a dirty word for you, 
um, you're not going to be successful. Or if you've got these money issues, if you have these negative beliefs around money, then you're not going to have a successful business because on the one hand, you're going to be saying, yeah, I want to start a business, but then when the money's coming, you're going, no, I don't want it. And, you know, I don't want to get all esoterical on you, but, you know, basically the, uh, some of you might have heard of law of attraction stuff, but basically it's the idea of the energy that you put into the world is what you get back. So if you're putting all this negative energy, I hate money, money stay away from me, that's what's going to happen. So I think for a lot of ethical businesses, a lot of activists who are looking to start up businesses, you've got to get over your money issues, okay? Um, as well as money issues, you need to manage yourself as well. So... Um, I did a lot of personal development. In 2012, I sort of had a, um, what's called a, a midlife unravelling. Um, and uh, a lovely author, some of you might have heard of, called Brene Brown, calls it um, a midlife unravelling because she says it's much more poetic than a crisis. So I'm going to go with that. And I had something similar. And I did a lot of personal development, a lot of self, you know, work on myself. And I think that's really, really important if you're running um, a business because it informs how you talk to your clients how you talk to your staff, how you communicate. Um, you don't want to be going on social media and ranting and raving, you know, if you want people to buy your stuff. It doesn't mean you can't take a stand, but there are just ways of communicating. And sometimes when we're triggered, you know, the, you know, you sometimes get the internet trolls coming onto your business page saying, oh, yeah, buy Rob Bacon, you know. And sometimes the instinct is to go, fuck you, you know, and all this. But as a business owner, it's not a good idea. You've got to be able to have some of those tools to manage yourself so that you can calmly, um, you know, explain and, and interact with people, okay? So... So yeah, mindset and, and self-development is super important. When I interviewed the people, I, I asked them, what kind of qualities do you think are essential in order to run a successful vegan-run business? And there were a few that they mentioned, but the one that was recited the most, that came like number one and the most, was resilience. And I think that's really, really quite telling because you've got to be resilient because there are, I don't know exactly how many people there are, there's a few billion people on the planet. Is every single person going to love your product or service? No, of course not. So you've got to learn how to cope with criticism. Um, and I think for a lot of us, again, you know, if we come from activist or creative backgrounds, if we haven't sorted out our own wounds or worked on ourselves, then we see criticism as a form of rejection. Um, and that can often crush someone's dreams. I've seen so many people either start up a creative project or they want to start a business, but they're being held back by the fear, the fear of um, you know, people criticizing them and saying negative things about them. Getting negative feedback about your product or service is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not talking about like the internet trolls, you know, the kind of people whose lives are so sad that they can only feel powerful by bringing someone else down. I'm not talking about them, but I'm talking about genuine customers or clients who maybe have not had such a great experience with your product or service um, and they've taken the time to give you feedback. Um, most of us, you know, sometimes we'll buy a product or service and it's not cut up to much, but we don't necessarily take the time to complain. We just let it go. But of course, we'll tell our family and friends. We might even go on social media, but we don't actually go back to the business owner and say, hey, you know, this was my experience and it wasn't great. So you can really use um, feedback, both positive and negative, to have a look, take it on board if it's relevant, and make a change, interact with the person who's made the negative feedback so that they feel acknowledged, um, and they can actually turn into your raving fans. They can go from someone who thinks you're a bit crap through to actually thinking you're pretty amazing. Yeah, another reason to be resilient, things will go to shit. They, they will when running a business. Um, you know, certainly if you, you know, the book is a how-to guide on how to start and grow a business, a vegan-run business, and certainly you'll get some great tools and tips and you can avoid some of the pitfalls. But running your own business, it's going to have its challenges and things will go wrong. And again, you've got to have those skills to be able to manage yourself to turn things around. Um, there's a guy in Australia called Jeremy Johnson. He runs a company called Vegan Perfection. He imports uh, goods from the UK, vegan products, mostly for food services and he sells them uh, to retail outlets in Australia. When he first started his business a few years ago, his first shipment from the UK to Australia, all perishable food items, got left outside 
at the airport at Dubai. Boiling hot temperatures, the whole shipment was ruined. His business almost was killed before it even got started. But, you know, he dug in, he, he and his partner, they were mortified, but they were determined, you know, to, to run this business and they had the skills to, to dig in and to continue. So, you know, things will go wrong um, and you've got to learn to manage it. So learning some tools and skills about how to be resilient is super important if you're going to run your own vegan business, any business, but including a vegan business. The next thing uh, that's really, really important about how to run a successful business is relationships. Relationships are key to your success, even more so now in this day and age. In traditional business models, yeah, you had to have a reasonably good relationship with your customers because you want them to come back and, and spend money with you. Uh, but nowadays, we've got social media. Everything is far more transparent. People want to know far more about you. So the, the better your relationships, the better your business. So I'm talking about relationships with your staff. Your staff are your ambassadors. You know, they're the ones that are at the front line, particularly if you're in a position to be able to step back or you need them to temporarily you know, look after your business. They are your ambassadors. You, want, you don't want someone who's there just because they want a job. But, you know, they're not really interested. You know, they want to clock off really quickly. You want people who are really rooting for you, who really want to make your business a success. So really treat your staff well. If you can't afford to pay them over and above, which you can't necessarily do, there are other ways to look after them. You know, to give them other kinds of perks um, so that they're really rooting for you. Obviously, your relationship with your customers and clients, that's absolutely paramount. Um, and again, on social media, um, people can just go on, they can give you reviews. There are review sites like Yelp and, and all this kind of thing. So you've really got to develop a good relationship with your customers and clients. Um, in the past, we had word of mouth. So you know, if I want to buy a product or service, I might ask a friend, oh, have you used that product or service? And if my friend says, yes, they're great, I'm likely to buy it because we'll buy because it's been recommended. Same goes if it's a bad experience. If my friend says, no, 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 I don't recommend them, you won't buy from them. Social media is merely an amplification of word of mouth. So you've really got to, um, to develop a great relationship. On social media, you need to be engaging with your clients. So don't just broadcast, post and run, you know, throw a load of sales messages at your, your people. You've really got to interact with them, share your stories, share your why, so that they feel an emotional connection with you. Because people buy based on how you make them feel. All right? They all remember, like Philip Wallen, who wrote the foreword to the book, he said that, to, he really na hit the nail on the head when he said that um, if people have a bad experience with a vegan business, there's two things they'll remember. One, the name of the owner, and two, that it was vegan. So we're kind of, as vegan business owners and entrepreneurs, we're held to higher standards. Um, so, you know, we've really got to be honest, be upfront with our clients, uh, be authentic and real. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But really important, even more nowadays, um, to really engage with your clients, um, get them Get them enthralled about their brands. You want them to become your brand ambassadors. You want them to become what Seth Godin, who's a marketing person, calls um, sneezers. So the idea is that they love you and your brand so much that they can't wait to tell their friends and their family um, about you, um, which is perfect because that's pretty much free marketing. You know, if you've got someone passionate about you and your product or service and they're telling everyone they know, that's free publicity and free marketing. So yeah, people based by based on how you make them feel. If you have a, if you give someone a bad experience with your brand, um, if you bold then rectify that in such a way that you over deliver to make it up for them, then you can turn that person around and they will come back to you because you've made them feel good. Even people will buy mediocre products if the customer service is outstanding because they feel good. You know when you get the warm and fuzzies when you, you've got that relationship with a brand, even if the product isn't necessarily perfect um, because you're making them feel good. So that's what you really want to do. You want to make your customers feel good no matter what your business is whether it's a product whether it's a service you want to be bowling over your customers and making them feel like that you are the best things in sliced bread I covered that yes yeah, social media is a, an amplification of word of mouth 
Collaborate, collaborate. In the past, the traditional business models, have you noticed how violent the language is? It, they very much talk about, let's kill the competition. We've got to crush it, which is not terribly vegan when you think about it. You know, if we're kind of preaching compassion to all, but we want to kill and crush the competition. Um, so what's happening a lot now is instead of thinking of your competitors as these, you know, um, people or, or companies or organizations that you've got to bring down, is actually to think of them as collaborators and particularly other vegan business owners and entrepreneurs you know because we're all in this together we've got this shared vision of a vegan world so think of them as collaborators how can you work together uh, doing various things so for example um, one of the interviewees that I interviewed is JL Fields and she's a health coach and um, she's also a trainer at um, Victoria Moran's Main Street Vegan Academy and she was training um, some health coaches who were in her local area in Colorado Springs. Instead of seeing them as competition and, oh my God, you know, these new people are coming to encroach on my territory. Instead, she got them all together, found out what particularly their specialities were. So one was interested in environment, health, uh, coaching for environment, one did Iron Man, and she's known for doing quick and easy meals. So she sent a media release out to the local Colorado press saying, look how lucky Colorado Springs is. We've got these great um, vegan health style co health coaches, and they've all got these different specialities. So that was a really great example of a collaboration. Instead of seeing these, these people coming in as competition, it was like, how can we work together? How can we refer business to one another? Um, Miss Cupcake does that. I'm going to talk about that around um, branding as well. But sometimes, you know, uh, Miss Cupcake, who's one of the, the businesses here, right, makes delicious cakes. Um, if she's super busy, she refers the business on. And, and it comes back to her. So if those other businesses are busy, they will refer it on. Um, also collaborate with influencers in your industry. So who are the big names in your industry? Who are the people with the big social media followings that might be interested in your vegan business, that might be interested in becoming brand ambassadors? And, and an easy and a cheap way, you know, an affordable way to, uh, to, come, to connect with them is on social media. You know, so comment on their posts, share their posts, do a retweet. Um, you know, comment on their, their Instagram, and you start to become noticed, um, and then eventually down the track, and don't just do it from a kind of, oh, well, what can they do for me? You know, share because you genuinely are interested uh, in what they're sharing and you think it's valuable, and that will actually, that will eventually, that will come back to you. Um, that certainly happened on a personal level with me. You know, I've connected with a lot of people, particularly a lot of those that I interviewed, and now those opportunities are coming back. Um, so collaboration is the new competition. <laughs> branding and marketing so obviously that's a huge topic branding and marketing is a huge topic but what I really want to impress on you which I touched on earlier is to be authentic it's a bit of a buzzword authenticity but it, it people are really they want you as business owners to be real to be you they don't want carbon copies um, there's a quote attributed to, I think it's Theodore Roosevelt, comparison is the thief of joy. And I think that's particularly true when you're, you're starting a vegan business or you're running it and you look at someone who's a bit further down the track than you. Now, you can be inspired by that, but often what we do is we get a whole lot of negative self-talk like, oh my God, they're so much better than me. How can I do that? Why am I doing this? And getting into a really negative state. And again, that can just stop you from pursuing your vegan business. Um, so people want, they don't want you to be a different version of another vegan business owner or entrepreneur. They want to know who you are, what's your story. Even corporates can't get away with it nowadays of hiding behind, you know, their PR and their publicists. You know, even the, the CEOs are now having to come out and show a bit of themselves. Um, and that's what will draw people to you. They want you to be real. This is Seth Tibbet, so some of you will have heard of Tofurky. It's absolutely massive in the US, and I noticed they're, they're here today. Seth was actually here yesterday. He's the owner, um, and he was behind the stall, very humbly, packing up the goods, which was pretty cool. But the interesting thing about Seth is that he said when he first started his business, he thought he had to be really sensible. He thought he had to be really conservative, because that's what businessmen did. Seth is not like that at all in person. He, when he first started his tempeh business, he ran it for 15 years without any success before hitting the big time with Tofurky. He couldn't even afford rent, 
So he, he rented three trees, built a tree house, and lived in a tree house for four years until he um, got success with Tofurky. So he's this fun-loving guy. He likes, he's colourful, he's fun, he's not this boring, staid businessman. And he said as soon as he was honest about that and started to be real and, and put himself out there in public, he infused that into the marketing of Tofurky, and the company started running competitions like, what would a Tofurky look like in the wild? So they started to have real fun with the brand, and that was when it really took off, because everything was congruent, everything was on message, the brand was, was real, you know, it was re reflective of, of who the founder is. So don't be afraid to be you and to be real. Um, don't try and fit yourself into a box. Um, now, I'm not saying go to the absolute extreme, like if you're someone who works in consulting and you want to work, or in catering, and you want to get into the, the corporate market and they ask you to come to a meeting, you're not going to turn up, you know, in ripped jeans and sandals. But, you know, you can uh, do... You can adjust yourself within the framework of who you are. So I love my bling. So at my Sydney book launch, I had a gold sequin jacket on. Now, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I haven't worn that today. It doesn't travel well. But, you know, I've got a bit of bling on. So you can, you can have that hint of who you are to stay true to who you are. Um, because it's really, really important. This is Miss Cupcake, who I mentioned. So... This is a great example of her being tr uh, true and authentic and this coming across in her branding. So in my interview with her, she said, look, you wouldn't come to me if you're looking for someone to make a cake for your traditional elegant wedding. You wouldn't come to Miss Cupcake. But if you want a fun cake for, say, a child with a dairy or an egg allergy, you'd definitely go to Miss Cupcake. You know, she describes herself as a crazy cupcake hat-wearing lady. She's very much saying who she is and who she's not. She's been very successful. She's stayed on message. She's built up a, a large social media following, and that led to a book deal. She's got her Miss Cupcake um, book out. So by being herself, by, you know, not just being this ordinary vegan bakery, she stood out from the crowd. Um, and, and as I mentioned, that informs your branding and your marketing, you know, informs how you speak, how you communicate to people, the language that you use. So some of you might have heard of Marie Forleo, who's quite a well-known business coach. So she, she talks about business um, and, and lifestyle, but she does it with a Jersey lingo because that's her, that's her brand. Okay, so really important to be authentic and to make sure that comes across in your branding and marketing. Stories. So I touched on that earlier. Telling stories. As human beings, we are hardwired to love stories. We can't help ourselves. This is why the, the traditional once upon a time is so powerful because we want to know what, what, what happened, what happened. Um, and so this is a way, again, for you to connect with your tribe, to attract people to you by sharing your stories. Um, there's a company in the book that I interviewed called Ethical Wares. They're one of England's, I think, oldest vegan shoe wear companies. Um, they tell how they've got rescued animals on their land. They live way out, I think, in Wales somewhere, and they've got rescued animals. They campaign for a free Tibet. And they tell people, they tell these stories. They tell the stories of the individual animals. And people love that. They particularly like it on social media. Um, um, there's another person in the book, Nikki Medwell, who runs a vegan bread and breakfast in Victoria in Australia. The posts that get the most likes, she's got a huge social media following, even though she's a, a, a bed and breakfast in regional Victoria, who most people not necessarily are going to go to, but when they do, they will certainly choose her. But they like her posts because she posts about her rescued animals. You know, cat videos are super popular on the, uh, the internet. So if you can incorporate your stories, and particularly if they involve animals, um, that can get people liking and sharing your posts. And that's really powerful, particularly on platforms like Facebook. The more likes and shares you get, the more Facebook will agree to show your posts unless you pay. So sharing your stories is a, is a really great way to, um, to get your brand out there, to get people into it, to get them sharing with their friends. Uh, uh, friends, their families, their networks, and that then grows your reach. So stories really, really important. Um, this is Gunas. So Gunas is a fantastic um, brand in New York that makes um, handbags and purses. They've got really interesting story because 
Um, when she first started her business, she had a studio in New York and it ended up being too expensive. So the products had to be priced too high. So she looked for a solution. She went to China first, but when she saw the a lot of the conditions in the factories, she knew that she couldn't um, have her products made there. She said, I couldn't um, have my products made in a place where the workers are so disconnected, you know, in like sort of sweatshop type conditions. So what she did was she went to India. She's actually Indian by descent. She went to India and she started up her own studio using um, local artisans who are paid a fair wage. And she tells this story. And certainly when you hear that kind of thing, when you hear the stories behind the brand, it makes you more likely to buy them, particularly if they're priced a little bit expensive, you know, instead of just dismissing a product and saying, oh, that's so expensive, you know, vegan businesses, you know, ripping us off. When you explain why, when you explain the stories behind your products and services and why they're having to be priced a bit higher, um, you can often get people on board because they feel warm and fuzzy because they're buying a product that's not only great quality, but it's also ethical, you know, particularly when it's ethical for people, animals and planet. So do share your stories. I'm sure a lot of you here, both aspiring business owners and existing business owners, you've probably got stories and you don't even know it. So it's a really good idea to, you know, Know, to think about some of the stories that you can share to get yourself out there. Oh, this is another one, Plamel. I'll share the, a, an example with Plamel. Plamel is one of the oldest um, companies in the UK, vegan companies in the UK. They started in, I think, the, the early 50s as uh, they were connected with the Vegan Society and Donna Watson. Um, and the founder, Adrian Ling, started up... Um, the Plant Milk Society, and they chatted a while until the 60s, and in the 1960s, they produced Europe's first soy milk. Now, when I first went vegan, Plamel was the vegan chocolate that I went to. I found a really lovely brand that was similar to Galaxy. It was nice and creamy, and my local health store became like my dealer. They literally became like my drug dealer. I loved this chocolate. I would go into the health food shop. I'd be like, can you order more of this, please? And then I'd be back in the next week. Um, and then, but because I knew about their background, um, every, even though now there's lots of amazing vegan chocolates, there's raw vegan chocolates, we're now so lucky. Um, there's a huge range of vegan chocolates. I will still buy a Plamel bar because of that history, because of that story, because, you know, they make all their products in a, a completely dedicated animal-free um, factory. You know, so because I know that, I will buy it because I want to support them. There's a restaurant here in London, some of you might know, 222, Veggie Vegan. Ben Asamani, he's one of my interviewees in the book, he said in the early days as he was getting off the ground, once the vegan people or the vegan community started to hear about it, they would go to 222, and they still do, to support that business because they don't want to see it close. They want to see it uh, to be a success. And that's what you want for your vegan businesses. You want people to support you. You want people to be rooting for your success, to go in there and maybe they don't necessarily, you know, they're not desperate for a meal, but they'll go out and have a meal or they'll buy your product or service just because you are an awesome company, because you have taken the time to do what's right for people, animals and planet. Oh, who are you? So that's connected with stories. So as well as, you know, people want to know your stories and they want to know who you are. So again, that's a bit connected with being authentic. You can no longer hide behind your brand. People want to know who you are. So if it's not, is it going to be you that's the face of your business? Or if you're with, in, a, in business with someone else, with a business partner or with, with other people, decide who's going to be the face of your business. Um, and put yourself out there and put it on your website. There's a lot of vegan businesses I've seen and you go to the about page and yeah, they tell you a bit about the company and that's great, but you're like, well, who's running it? Some faceless robots, you know? Um, so put that on your website. It's also really good for the media. As a journalist, you know, if I'm looking to do, to, to do interviews, when I go to a website and I look at the about page, I wanna know who, who are the people behind the company as well. So make sure you put that in your bio and make sure your bio are interesting and entertaining so as well as you know your professional background and how you got into it people want to know that if there's anything quirky and interesting about you or you've got you know um, a strange or an interesting hobby as long as it's legal of course um, you know put that on your website because it just adds to a bit of color you know it makes you um, a bit more interesting and it certainly makes journalists more uh, inclined to interview you because it makes you stand out 
Because nowadays, of course, you're not just competing, and I use that word in, in quotes, you're not just in the marketplace with non-vegan businesses, you're now in a marketplace where there are other vegan businesses. So within that marketplace, you've got to stand out. So you've got to figure out what makes me different, what makes my product or my service different and stand out so that you can uh, get people coming to you. So here, this is JL Fields. I mentioned her earlier. She's the um, health coach um, in America. This is a good example of her being herself. Um, so she does health coaching. So it's more of a service-based industry. And she's very um, honest and opinionated. And um, she said in her interview with me how um, she's very much against the whole vegans are skinny. She's very anti that. She's very, you know, healthy um, and it's, you know, you're, you get into vegan because of the ethics and she doesn't like all the body fascism and body shaming that can sometimes happen within certain factions of the vegan community. And she, she puts that out on Twitter, on her Facebook. And she gets business from it um, because, like, she had one woman, for example, who saw her tweet about this and um, contacted her and said, look, my doctor says that, you know, I need to make some changes to my diet. I, I want to work with you because I know you're not just going to try and make me super skinny, but that you just want me to be healthy. Um, so it can get you business. Don't be afraid to be yourself or to state your opinions or to take a stand on something because that can be the very thing that will get you business. So JL's a good example of that. Um, this is Guacam Guacamole and Danny from, they run a, a company called Vegan Proteins. Um, so they run a, suppl a vegan supplement company from Massachusetts, it's online. They also have their own nonprofit called Plant Built. So they're vegan bodybuilders, they do um, fitness strength competitions and everything. So by being, by walking their talk, if you were gonna buy vegan supplements, you know, are you gonna buy them from some random company that's maybe jumped on the vegan bandwagon, or are you gonna to buy them from these guys who are walking their talk you know so be yourself because people really will I know I'm, I'm repeating that but I, I do really want to stress that because you know that's what people are going to buy so yes, yeah, so I'm going to wrap it, wrapping up now. Um, Philip Wallen, some of you may have heard of him. He was a keynote speaker here last year. He's based in Australia. He's the former vice president of Citibank. So he was a renowned merchant banker, highly successful, sought after merchant banker. And um, he had an epiphany, like many of us, and completely changed. He resigned and he runs a, um, a non-profit called the Kindness Trust. And he basically wants to die broke. So he's giving away all his millions to projects that help people, animals, and planet. But he's also still a very, very astute businessman. He's owned his own businesses. He invests in businesses. You know, he's very, very savvy. He knows what's going on in the business and the corporate world. So I was really happy that he wrote this. This is a quote from the foreword from the book. And it's the future for well-run, properly structured, and strategically positioned vegan businesses has never been brighter. So I think that's really wonderful because that's from someone who knows. And I know I mentioned that at, at the beginning, but to hear that from someone like Philip, um, and he's not a fluffy guy, like he calls it as it is. So he, he's not gonna you know, do all this inspiring kind of stuff. He's very straightforward, down to business kind of guy. So the fact that he is saying this, I think means something. Same as we've got Bill Gates investing in Beyond Meat, you know, a vegan um, meat alternative. I know Bill's hedging his bets because he also invests in GMOs and stuff, but even the fact that he's putting his money in, in vegan-run businesses really means that we are on the crest of a wave, and it's exciting. It's exciting for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, I've met quite a lot of them here today. I was on my stall all day yesterday, and I was so happy to meet lots of people, different ages from different countries. Some are here today, um, you know, who are starting vegan-run businesses in different countries. Some of them are the first business of their kind in their particular town. It's it's really exciting and just as a little media tip for you before I finish, being the first, whether it's a world first or a, a national first or at your local first, really good angle to get local media and to raise the profile of your business. So 
So look, um, obviously that was a big, uh, that was just a, a helicopter ride over how to start and grow a vegan business. Um, obviously there are a lot more in the book, so here's my little promo of it. Um, my stall is quite handy, it's just across there. If you are thinking of running, starting and growing a vegan run business, as I say, the insights that the interviewees have shared that are weaved throughout the book really are worth their weight in gold. Um, so I do encourage you to grab a copy, it's just 10 pounds today um, in cash because I now live in Australia and it was too hard to do cards. Um, you know, do, do get a copy, be inspired. Also find out what you're in for, um, you know, what the pitfalls are and um, seriously go make it.